Hey everybody, welcome to Tutor Terrific. I have for you here uh, basically a part three of my basic reactions video. This is a video on double replacement reactions, the fifth of the five reaction types. This might be the most complicated reactions to complete, but it is very important as a high school chemist to understand how to do this, or if you're going into college chemistry, you really gotta have this down. So we're gonna analyze double replacement reactions today. First, um, I wanna point out the reactions model here. We have two compounds, two compounds combining in uh, the double replacement reaction. I'll talk about these little subscripts here in a second. So you've got a compound AB, which is gonna combine with a compound CD, and if the reaction occurs, it will yield um, a compound AD plus compound CB. Now let me explain what happens in a double replacement. The two cations switch anion partners. Um, a good analogy for this would be like this TLC show, Wife Swap, where two wives exchange husbands for a certain amount of time and learn how to appreciate their own husbands when they go back to their uh, home family. It's quite an interesting show. I don't know if I agree with it, but it's quite entertaining. So imagine A and B, A and C are the wives, and they literally swap husbands. So um, do not mix mix up the order of anions and cations when you do this. A and C are cations, so they need to remain first when the partners are switched. See how A and C are still in the first slots in those compounds, and B and D remain last. So the easiest way to do this would just be to switch anions, really. And uh, as you can see, that's what's done here. Now, the reaction occurs if a um, certain type of product results. Now, let me go over the key before I get into that. The key here tells us this new set of subscripts that we have to uh, be adding to our um, compounds on both the reactants and the product side. So AQ stands for aqueous, which means uh, it's dissolved in water. Now, one thing I haven't told you yet is that a lot of these double replacement reactions occur with water as a solvent. So there, these things are dissolved in water. And AQ, that's literally what that means. It's aqueous, which means it's in water solution. S, in parentheses, is reserved, means solid uh, specifically, but uh, what we use it for in double replacement reactions is when um, something is not soluble in water that's formed in the reaction, and that is called specifically a precipitate reaction, and a precipitate forms, um, and it literally is visible after maybe two clear liquids are mixed together. You see this uh, milky substance or this yellow substance in some cases, uh, and it's quite, it's, it seems like magic, but it's, uh, you're just forming something that's not soluble in water, and so it, uh, uh, dissolves out of solution as a precipitate. That's what it's called. G is reserved for gas. Um, so if one of your products happens to be a gas, it will literally bubble out of the solution. And that means it's not soluble in water also, and it will create bubbles like uh, hydrogen gas, for example. That's just one example. Um, and then L, liquid. So if we have two liquids that do not mix, uh, uh, a liquid that doesn't mix with water will separate out of solution, such as, for example, oil does not mix with water. We're not gonna deal specifically with uh, G or L as much as we are with S, but um, what I want you to understand is that a double replacement reaction generally occurs only if there is an S, G, or L, so a solid, gas, or liquid that does not dissolve in water that is formed. If uh, the two products are both aqueous in solution, that means normally the reaction will not occur. That's something that you don't always hear in your high school classes, but it is true. Now, one more thing before I uh, uh, move on. How do you tell if something is aqueous or not? Well, you use a solubility chart uh, or the solubility rules, and I have that right here. I'm just gonna move this closer to the camera so you can see. Uh, in the top, they have the basic solubility rules that all of maybe your parents or uh, your older compadres had to learn this way. We didn't really have the charts like you guys do. Um, so if you look at this, there are about seven rules. The first two rules tell you what's always soluble in water. So any cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, those are all the group one elements, and ammonium. So any compounds you make with those are actually soluble. So when those are the cations, no matter what the anions are, it's soluble. 
Now, let's continue. Uh, rule number two tells us that all these anions, all the compounds made with them, nitrates, chlorates, perchlorates, and acetates, every single one that you can make with those as anions are soluble as well. So those are uh, pretty easy rules to remember. They're always soluble. Okay, now um, rule three is like, yeah, that's normally soluble. Chlorides, bromides, and iodides. So those are some of the halogens. And uh, there are exceptions to this rule, and that is notably some bad actors, silver, lead, and mercury, uh, Roman numeral one. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into why that's called Roman numeral one mercury, but that's what it is. Those are not soluble chloride, bromide, or iodide um, co compounds for sure. Now, uh, rule one is an exception, but uh, carbonates, chromates, phosphates, and sulfides sulfites, excuse me, are generally insoluble, but when they combine with a group one element, such as above, they are soluble, but other than that, they are not, okay? So we'll watch out for those anions. We usually get um, insoluble situation or precipitate forming. Um, number five, so uh, if we, uh, ex with the exception of rule one and the barium ion, hydroxides and sulfides are insoluble. Now there's exceptions to that rule too with those uh, group one uh, compounds or ammonium, but generally the um, hydroxides and sulfides are insoluble in water. And then rule two, which is about nitrates, chlorides, perchlorates, and acetates being soluble, if we uh, allow that exception, generally speaking, mercury, uh, Roman numeral one, silver, and lead Salts are insoluble. Now we saw that already in rule three that they were bad actors. They're generally bad actors. They're generally not soluble except when they're combined with Roman uh, rule number two anions. Then uh, rule seven, calcium, strontium, and barium, uh, all the sulfates are soluble of those. Uh, oh, excuse me, all sulfates are soluble except for calcium, strontium, barium, and all these guys, like silver, mercury one, and lead two, actually that's lead Roman numeral two, those are um, soluble sulfates. So sulfate's got a lot of exceptions to it, but most sulfates are soluble. Now that's a lot to remember, and there's actually a song that exists to remember all these, no thanks. Um, there's a nice chart. This is just one example of a super duper chart that kind of lays this all out for you. It lays out the cations right here and the anions up here, you'd combine one cation with one anion. For example, aluminum chlorate. Let's say aluminum chlorate is one of your compounds. You have to figure out whether it's soluble or not. It's soluble in this chart if it has an AQ in that box. For aluminum chlorate, for example, that has an AQ that's soluble. If you see an S, such as aluminum fluoride, for example, that's not soluble because you see an S, so it would form a precipitate. You can see some blanks in here, and you can see some lines. Those are for ones that don't follow the normal rules. Maybe they don't actually exist, or they um, there's multiple iterations of them, and so some are soluble, some aren't. Maybe uh, some form liquids, some form uh, gases. But uh, generally speaking, a chart like this, a pretty basic chart, which is definitely not exhaustive in either list by any means, um, will suffice for your first class chemistry. Okay, so we're gonna refer to this chart for sure in my examples. Okay, so let's work on these examples. I'll leave the solubility rules there when we need them. So what we're gonna do is we're going to first determine uh, what the uh, products will be, and we'll assume all of these will occur even if we get two aqueous solutions um, as products. Uh, but I want to, to determine what the products will be I want you to determine if they're soluble or not, and I want uh, you to also charge balance them and then balance the reaction. So there's quite a bit to do in these double replacement reactions that we didn't have in the other types of reactions we studied. So we've got CaNO32, which is calcium nitrate, um, and we've got potassium bromide. So if the reaction occurs, what's going to happen is calcium and potassium will switch anions. So we will have calcium bromide now so put the bromide with the calcium and put the nitrate with the potassium so we'll get k and o3 
Now, we can't just write AQ by them because we don't know if they're soluble or not. We have to look at the solubility chart. So let me hold this up for you. So you can see, let's find calcium bromide. Here's calcium and you go two over, you can see bromide. And you can see that it's aqueous. So that means calcium bromide is soluble. The other one is potassium nitrate. Potassium, way down here, you go over to nitrate, which is right here. Oh, that's also soluble. So generally, this reaction wouldn't necessarily occur, but we're going to assume it does here because um, just for the sake of balancing these guys and all that, getting some practice. So technically, we've got a reaction that does not favor to occur. We're going to assume it does. And now we're going to balance. Okay, so calcium and bromine. Bromine is an halogen, group 7, so it has a charge of minus 1 in an ion form. Calcium is in group 2, alkaline earth metal, so it's plus 2. Uh-oh, we've, we've got a problem with balancing. In order to fix this, I'll have to add a bromine so that I have two bromines. So we have CaBr2. Now we've got a plus 2 and minus 2 balance. Now we've got to check potassium and nitrate. Nitrate is minus 1. Potassium is plus 1. You gotta memorize these nitrates and all these other polyatomic ions. You gotta know their charges. Potassium plus one, nitrate minus one, we're good to go. The one to one ratio. Okay, now that we've looked at the solubility rules, we've uh, created the correct products, we need to balance the reaction. So let's look at calcium so to start from the left and go to the right. Calcium is one on each side. So that's good. Nitrogen. There are two nitrogens on the reacted side. There's only one on the product side, so I'm going to need to double this whole compound in order to address that. It's obviously going to affect a few things. Notably, uh, uh, potassium has now been affected. There are two potassiums on the uh, product side, but only one on the reactant side, so I'll need to double that. Now I have two potassiums, and that, of course, now doubled the number of bromines I have, but it made it balance because two bromines on this side will balance with the two bromines on this side. Okay, let's check everything to make sure everything's balanced. There's one calcium on each side. There are two nitrogens on each side. There are how many oxygens? Three times two, six on the reactant side. And there are two times three, six on the product side. Then we'll go to the next compound, potassium. There are two on the uh, reactant side and there's two on the product side. Bromine, there's two on the reactant side and two on the product side. So this reaction, if it occurred, is now balanced. Okay, next, we've got sodium hydroxide combined with iron two chloride. Iron Roman numeral two because it has to be plus two to combine this way with chlorine, which is normally minus one. Okay, so if the reaction were to occur, we'd get the following products. Switch the places of the anions, just leave the cations where they are, it makes it simple. So we're gonna have sodium chloride and we're going to and why don't I meet uh, bring the two over because I'm going to uh, rebalance by charges anyway so I don't need to do that the only place where I would keep the uh, subscripts is when I have a polyatomic ion like nitrate I'm going to keep the three for the oxygen because that has to do with the anion itself okay so there's sodium chloride and the other one will be iron hydroxide okay now generally these in this stage of the game, you're not studying oxidation or reduction reactions, and so you're going to assume that the iron will keep the same charge since it's capable of having more than one oxidation number. Um, so when you charge balance this, keep that in mind. But let's start with sodium and chloride. Chlorine is a charge of minus one since it's a halogen. Sodium has a charge of plus one because it's a group one metal. So one to one ratio, this is charge balanced. Now over here, we have hydroxide. Again, you got to memorize these. OH is minus one charge, but iron over here was Roman numeral two, so that's two plus. It needs to remain two plus, okay, since this is not uh, an ox uh, oxidation reduction reaction. We're going to study that a lot later from now. Um, so here we are. This is not balanced. We will need actually, since this OH is minus one, against a plus two iron, we're going to need two hydroxide ions. So you got to put that in parentheses because we're I'm increasing the amount of the entire hydroxide 
um, polyatomic ion. All right, so now we're charge balanced. Let's check and um, see what these actual compounds are and if they are soluble or insoluble in water. Okay, so first we have sodium chloride. I think you know that's table salt. I know it's soluble, but let's just check the chart. Sodium and chloride is the fourth one over. Yes, AQ. So that is, uh, excuse me, the fifth one over. That is soluble. The other one, iron hydroxide. I don't hold out much hope for that because um, a lot of the hydroxides are insoluble. Uh, iron, Roman numeral two right there. If we go over to hydroxide, oh, not soluble. It's got an S. This is going to form a solid precipitate. It um, form one of those milky or powdery substances when this reaction occurs. So sodium chloride will get an AQ, and iron hydroxide, Roman numeral two, will get an S. So this is a precipitate reaction specifically. All right, now let's balance the whole reaction. So far so good with sodium, one on each side. Uh, usually, just so you know, it's easiest to save oxygen for last, generally speaking, because in some cases like this fourth example, we're gonna have oxygens all over the place. But here, since we only have one example of oxygen on each side, we can balance it now. Um, there's one on this side, but there are two, because of that two down there, on this side. So that means we're gonna have to double sodium hydroxide's concentration. And uh, because I just messed up the sodium, I'm gonna go fix that on the other side, so now there's two sodiums on each side. So there's two sodiums and two oxygens on each side. And uh, now I've created a situation where I have two hydrogens on the reactant side, but I needed that anyway because I had two hydrogens on the product side. All right, so three of the elements are done. We have two left. Iron, um, one on the reactant side, one on the product side. Remember that little subscripts, those little subscripts only apply to what's directly in front of them, and that means inside the parentheses if there's a parenthesis. Now, um, also, uh, let's look at chlorine. There are two chlorines on the reactant side. Uh, voila, there are also two um, uh, chlorines on the product side as well. So this is fully balanced with those two additions of sub, uh, coefficients there. Okay, so we saw an example of a reaction that generally is ten, uh, favored to occur and forms a precipitate. Let's look at this next one. We've got lead nitrate, Roman numeral two lead because it's combining with two NO3s, which are minus one each. Uh, I don't like that lead. We usually, uh, lead is insoluble. Of course, by the first, uh, the second rule, uh, lead nitrate is actually soluble. Um, potassium chloride, that's soluble because it's got a potassium in it. So let's see what happens if we assume this reaction occurs. Switching the anions, we'll have lead chloride. I don't hold out much hope for that to be soluble. And we've also got potassium nitrate. I hold out a ton of hope that that's soluble. Okay, let's charge balance and then we'll check the chart. So lead chloride, oh my goodness. It's lead Roman numeral two. Again, this is not an oxidation reduction reaction, so we assume that stays the same. Lead Roman numeral two means it's two plus against chlorine, which we've seen before is minus one. So we'll need two chlorines to make minus two against a plus two and they balance. Uh, potassium is plus one since it's a group one metal and nitrate is minus one. Um, you need to memorize that. So that's good to go. Now let's uh, check the chart. So this chart says for lead, <laughs> most things are insoluble. Uh, we've got lead two here, lead two chloride. I am correct, lead two chloride, no way, insoluble. And then we're gonna check potassium nitrate just for kicks. Uh, potassium right here, go over to nitrate. Uh, definitely soluble. All the potassiums are soluble and all the nitrates are soluble. So that's like a cross through the chart of AQs. All right, now back to here. Uh, lead to chloride is going to get an S, and potassium nitrate is going to get an AQ. So this is going to form a nice little precipitate. Okay, let's go ahead and balance the reaction. 
there's one lead on the reactant side, there's one lead on the product side. Good so far. Nitrogen, oh boy, there are two nitrogens on the product uh, reactant side. Oh, there's only one on the product side, so we're gonna need to double that whole compound. Continuing, let's check oxygen. There are six oxygens, three times two, on the reactant side, and oh, there are three times two reactions, uh, excuse me, oxygens on the product side, so that's actually good, I made that balance. Now let's go to potassium, K. Uh, there's only one on the reactant side and two on the product side. I'm gonna need to double the KCl potassium chloride compound, and then check chlorine. Now there's two chlorines here, but there's also two chlorines on the uh, product side, so that's good to go. All good to go. This is uh, completely balanced now. All right, let's check this one. This one, crazy. What's gonna happen here? Um, just gotta keep track. There's a lot of oxygens, there's a lot of crazy things. By the way, NH4 is ammonium, okay? Ammonium is not present. Oh, actually it is. It is present on this chart. I thought it wasn't, it is. So we can check the solubility chart uh, to see if this reaction forms a precipitate or not. Um, so, uh, switch the anions. We're gonna have ammonium nitrate. Now I'm taking away all the parentheses here because we're gonna redo that charge balancing, okay? So NH4, two, I take that away, just put NH4 with the nitrate, and then I'm gonna have barium sulfate. Don't hold out a lot of hope for that. We'll check the chart. Okay, let's charge balance first. Ammonium is plus one, okay, it's plus one, and you saw that when I went over rule number one of the solubility rules. And um, nitrate, as you know by now, since we've done it so much, is minus one. So this is a one-to-one -one ratio, it's good to go. Barium sulfate, now. Barium is a group two metal, and so it is plus two. And sulfate is a minus two charge. Again, you have to memorize that. So this is actually good to go as well. It's plus two against minus two. Now let's check the solubility chart. See if a precipitate forms or something else. If you look at the chart, ammonium nitrate is soluble. So that's aqueous. And uh, barium sulfate, here we go, cross your fingers. Barium, scoot all the way over to sulfate. Nope, that is insoluble. So another precipitate reaction here. I'm curious to see what colors actually come out of this if you're to do these, but I'm sure you can find videos online to uh, suit yourself. Check it out. So I'll put an S by the barium sulfate. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, check this and see um, uh, what we can do here to balance the whole reaction. It's gonna be a little tricky, okay? We've got um, two nitrogens with uh, this particular compound, but we have two nitrogens also with the other compounds. So we have four altogether. On the other side, um, it looks like we only have two since they both uh, combine with the first product, ammonium nitrate. So we're gonna need to double that to make four. Okay, of course that changed a lot of other things, but let's just go through the list here. Hydrogen, thankfully, only exists in ammonium. So there's eight of those here, four times two, on the reactant side. And look on the product side. Now that I doubled the whole compound, there are eight hydrogens, two times four, on the product side. So that's done. Um, going on, we have sulfur next. Sulfur, there's just one on the uh, reactant side, but there's also just one on the product side. So that's good to go. Then we're gonna do barium. Remember, I'm saving oxygen for last, especially here because there's so many of them. Save it for last. Barium, there's just one on the reactant side and there's just one on the product side. So that's good. Now let's check oxygen. Got a lot to count. We've got four in the first compound, ammonium sulfate, and we've got six in the second compound, barium nitrate, making 10 total, 10 total oxygens on the reactant side. Crossing our fingers, product side, three times two, six, plus, aha, yes, four. Makes 10 total oxygen atoms. Wow, with just a single two there, everything is balanced. All right, I got two more examples that are a little bit um, more unique than the others. So here we have 
hydrogen chloride and sodium hydroxide, okay? Um, let's assume it's gonna occur. And any of you who studied acids and bases before, you know what's gonna happen. This is a neutralization reaction type double replacement, but let's just do it as normal. So um, switch the anions. So we're gonna get um, HOH. Uh, we need to study that, but in a second. And then we're gonna get sodium and chloride which we already know is soluble in water, so that'll be aqueous. But what's HOH? Well, this is gonna combine like this. It's gonna make water. HOH is water. Now water is obviously a liquid, and it kind of mixes with itself, uh, so it's hard to say if it's soluble or not, because it's water also. And so that gets an L, because it's a liquid in a liquid. It's not just for, L is not just for liquids that are not uh, insoluble, but it's also for water to denote that, hey, we're not dealing with vapor here, we're dealing with liquid water. Okay, so let's charge balance this. Uh, NaCl plus one, uh, minus one for Cl, so we already know that's good to go. We know it's soluble, we know water's a liquid. Let's balance the whole reaction. So we've got two hydrogens, two hydrogens. We've got one chlorine one chlorine. We've got one sodium, one sodium. We have one oxygen, one oxygen. There you go. Sometimes they're already balanced after you charge balance them. It's not often, but in this case, that's how it worked out. Now this next one I, I really have an interesting history with. Um, we've got sodium cyanide. Now whenever you see cyanide, think death, because most things that are made with cyanide are poisonous. Um, so that's in solution plus hydrogen bromide. That's in solution. Uh, let's assume this reaction occurs. What will we make? We will make sodium bromide. Sodium bromide. I'm changing the anions positions. And we're going to make this lovely little guy, HCN, hydrogen cyanide. Um, hydrogen cyanide is actually a gas. And so it will bubble out of solution. And uh, sodium bromide is, um, well, let's check. Let's go ahead and check that guy. The reason I told you about hydrogen cyanide is actually cyanide is not on the list. Um, there are many lists that have it, but this one does not. Um, so sodium, let's go down to sodium, and then uh, bromide, it's the second one. Ah, it is um, aqueous, so that is dissolved in solution. So we're not forming a precipitate and a gas, just a gas. So this is one of those situations we have on that bubbles out of solution, but you better hope you're on another planet when this does because this stuff is super, super poisonous and will kill you. So my story behind uh, this is um, I actually saw this reaction somewhere in a textbook when I was in high school chemistry and I asked my wonderful teacher, Mrs. Tarr, so what's gonna, can we mix sodium cyanide and hydrogen bromide together um, and see what happens? And she smiled at me and said, okay, moving on. And it was really funny because um, she knew it. I she knew I had studied it, and she knew I knew it was going to make hydrogen cyanide gas, and uh, and it was very poisonous. So, uh, just some good memories. When you understand what's going on in chemistry, it can be a lot of fun. So I hope these videos help you. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. Until next time, this is Falconator signing out.